Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season here today with Lisa and Venkat. How's it going, Venkat? Hey, Lisa. All right, so the topic for today is the letter S, right? So yep. what, are we, what are we talking about for S? Uh, we're talking about sellouts. Sellouts. Yeah. Venkat, have you ever sold out? What did you sell out for? I don't know that I've ever bought in. So, you know, buying in is the opposite of selling out. So I don't know if I've done that either. Uh, have I sold out? No, I don't think so. I mean, to sell out, you have to buy in, right? You have to buy into a particular, like uh, in a literal sense, yeah, you can buy into a stock and then sell out of the stock. That's like a non-human version. It's like commerce, but in the sense of like, you know, relationships with a subculture or a community uh, that's how people think of selling out right like you're in some sort of subculture and then you sell out like maybe you're in an indie music scene and then you sell out with like some big evil record label that's the sort of usual sense right yeah you monetize uh, the fan base right it's some it's to some amount of converting your social capital into cold hard cash a little that's bit. a good definition so converting your social capital into cold hard cash so is that what selling out is I, I think so. I mean, someone was talking about, so like, I, it kind of came up on someone on Twitter had a post about how, kind of commenting on how like some musicians, I think like Snoop Dogg, were getting into the NFT game, launching an NFT, and how it didn't, they didn't, they either like, I'm not sure what the, the thing is, like maybe they weren't selling for as much as like other NFTs were selling for. Um, I was like, yeah, it's because like the, the people launching it is like, they've sold out, like they're not like connected to their community. So when people go to buy these NFTs, they're not really sure what they're buying. They're just buying like a trinket, right? It's like going to the show and buying Snoop Dogg bobblehead. Um, Snoop Dogg bobblehead sell for like 20 bucks, sure, but you can take them home, put them on like your mantelpiece or your car, car dashboard. NFTs you can't really like put anywhere. I don't know. Well, uh, but wait, uh, is it really about the specific thing you're selling out with, whether it's an NFT or selling t-shirts or whatever, or is it about the expectations you set? Like, um, let me try to think of an example, like uh, way back when people were first talking about like, you know, putting up paywalls and charging for blogs and stuff. I, so people were, this was like 10 years ago before Substack and stuff and uh, people were, uh, uh, making claims about like, you know, am I going to start a community or not? And I think when I went free agent 10 years ago, I said something like, I'll never start a paid community for Ribbon Farm. And in that sense, I've never sold out because Ribbon Farm is still free. But then I started a separate newsletter and some of my writing is now appearing there. And some people could say I've not honored the, you know, spirit of the agreement, even if I've uh, honored the letter of the agreement, like I've taken some of my writing somewhere else where I have created sort of a paywalled garden. So is that a sellout or no? Because the other know. thing is still running. So I think like, I think the thing about selling out is like some amount of, hmm, I almost feel like there's some disintermediation that happens between yourself and the community. So like, even though you're charging for stuff, like it's still, you're close, you're still close to your community. Like Patreons and stuff don't feel like selling out so much as like, they feel like just kind of changing the nature of your relationship with your community. But that's important, that isn't it? Like, I mean, people thought they were close to you in one way and then you turn around and say, hey, I'm still close to you, but we are actually close in another way. We are like charging you, right? Like, uh, let's take a clear example. Like just this morning, I was reading this uh, uh, article in the New York Times about how the Trump uh, campaign last year Mm. At one point, it was accounting for like 3%, 1 to 3% of all credit card fraud. So this is um, down your uh, uh, alley. So what happened was sometime in July, when they were struggling with fundraising, they created like some sort of shady, dark pattern, double opt-in thing in the app, where if you thought you were contributing to the Trump campaign uh, once, like say 100 bucks uh, one-time deal, uh, they actually had like obscure terms of service. So it actually became a weekly recurring charge. And then a lot of people like including those, um, the New York Times of course led with the story of this cancer fighting retiree who gave a one-time $500 thing and then realized like a few months later that 
you know, they had lost thousands of dollars based on that. So that's, I think, a very clear example of selling out. Like, you've got a community that trusts you and you kind of like um, hack their agreement and they think they're giving you a one-time donation and suddenly they're giving you weekly donations. Yeah, I think that aspect of trust is kind of the important thing. Like, so, so another example of like selling out um, is like, I don't know any like on the, uh, like, I don't know any concrete examples of this happening, but I've heard that like, really nice restaurant, so like restaurant, um, the restaurant scene in New York City is really competitive. Um, it's really, it's really normal that like a, a new big name chef will open a new restaurant It'll get a lot of really great buzz. All the restaurant critics will come to it and try it out and enjoy the food. And it'll be like the real authentic experience of the chef. And then once it's gotten like maybe a year, year or two later, the chef wants to move on to the next thing. They don't shut the restaurant down. They like keep all the same stuff, but like change out the back office, back office, so to speak. So it yep. still looks and feels like the same place maybe, but the food isn't as good because the they've sold out because they've sold out because they've like whoever was like cared about the person who cared about the quality and the production of the actual like authenticity of the good that you're buying as a, like a patron has moved on to the next thing and all that's left is like a profit making puppy or whatever like so the, what you're describing sounds like um, kind of a bait and switch right like you have a big name restaurateur giving you high quality food and six months later you go back and it's like they're uh, second sous chef student who's taken over and running it with cheaper ingredients and now they're milking it for profit right so there's it's selling out though right you sell yeah. out the dream for the money uh and wait but is it selling out though like if it if you intended to do it all along then it's more like a long con or a bait and I don't switch think it, so i you know honestly i don't think that anyone when they start a restaurant starts it intending to sell out of it i think it just happens that like you you get bored, you want to move on to the next thing. So you find some, you find someone who wants to buy a restaurant that earns money. And so you sell it. I, I don't know, because I've seen like enough cynical people. So think about what you're selling out. Like you have a certain reputation and your uh, customers have a certain expectation of you. You establish a relationship. The brand is that relationship. Yeah. And then you walk away and like sell it for a profit. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out that initially you were actually making a loss and you knew it and you intended to do this all along. Like I've met people who clearly think this way. Like they're like, we'll build it up. And then, you know, uh, cause like there's even like ways of talking about it that sound uh, uh, kind of like, oh, this is normal business practice, like a cost down, right? Like there's two, uh, there's two kinds of cost down. You build a thing and because there's a lot of R and D that goes into it and lots of trial and error, once you figure it out, then you can lower costs without affecting the quality of the product. This is what happens to like, you know, uh, quality car brands or something like the price can come down, but the quality will stay the same. But if it turns out that um, you're lowering the cost by sort of hollowing out and cutting corners, that's kind of like selling out the trust of the customer. Um, and I think a lot of people do like the apartment we just moved into, it got sold from one PE firm to another. And some like minor things have improved, but overall the service has gone down. And that's like, yeah, that's standard in real estate, like selling to a more sort of hard ass um, landlord, right? Do you have the place you live currently or the last one? You yeah, live? the current place uh, I live. It's still not bad. I mean, it's like, I've lived in enough apartments that I know this is par for the course. Like sometimes you sign up for an apartment knowing that the landlord is nice and that they maintain things well, but you know that slight squeeze they might sell out to somebody who's like you know does a worse job but, but there's something about so all the examples we're talking about is selling out uh, like a producer selling out a customer or consumer or some sort of patron or whatever uh, when i think of the word selling out mostly i think of producers selling out other producers so for example if you have like an indie music scene and multiple musicians like uh, you know pioneer or genre and one of them like takes the big deal and uh, goes away. The other musicians are the ones who are gonna tell the first musician, hey, you sold out. Like you sold out the values of our aesthetic movement or something. Yeah, but what is that? I mean, so in music, so I think, well, yeah, let's talk about the music industry. What does it mean? And, and so what does it mean when you sign on with a big producer? How does your relationship with your, um, how does your relationship change? Like what is, what is the nature of a contract with a big producer? 
Okay, so there's two contracts here. There's the contract with your cohort of like fellow creatives with whom you're like developing sort of the artistic scene. And then there is the contract with the producer, right? And I think the clearest example of this sort of thing is uh, black versus white musicians in the US, especially in like the early days of genres. Like Elvis Presley, for example, at some point was uh, accused of like, uh, getting a lot of inspiration from black music and the black music scene. But then because he was a 1950s white singer, he could get a better deal and he took it, right? And this is like not just 1950s. I think something similar, uh, like a Macklemore, Eminem and all these sort of uh, white rappers, um, it, it's been the same story over and over again, where it's like your, your sort of social, since we would, your definition was selling out social contract for capital uh, gain or something, right? So in this case, it's very clear because your social contract is with fellow musicians who may not all have like the same position in society as you. So you might be a white musician um, jamming with a black musician, but then the record label comes and you get the contract as the white musician. So that's, so what if, I think, what, what I think of getting the out. contract mean for those relationships? Like, why do they, I don't wanna say go away, but like, it says something about your relationship to the community changes. What does it change exactly? Like, is it that you're allowed to okay, collaborate? Okay, here's, here's my definition. There's an implicit part of the social contract that says we are in this together. We are creating this new art together. Therefore, any benefits we get, we will share equally. There's that implicit contract in a lot of like uh, jamming and creative co-production. And um, like this actually, an even clearer example happens in, um, uh, television shows like on Friends in the 90s, I believe one of the things that made the show unusual was at one point, uh, the guy who plays Ross, the uh, one of the six friends, right? Uh, have you ever watched Friends? Once, twice. I've seen okay, it. So you know the uh, characters, right? Uh, so the guy who plays uh, Ross, he was apparently the highest billing one and um, they offered him a higher contract and the rest lower. But he said no, and he said, we're all gonna get paid the same. And that's one of the reasons the cast kind of bonded and like kept the same contract. Whereas another example is the rebooted version of Hawaii Five-0, which has two Korean characters and a bunch of like white characters. And at some point it came out that the Korean characters were being, uh, they were playing Hawaiians, but they're Korean actors. They were being paid uh, much less. And when they sort of made a fuss about it, they were written off the show. And the interesting thing is you could say the other actors sold them out because they could have stood up for them. They could have said, no, everybody gets paid the same and we'll take a pay cut or something, right? So yeah. I think that's I think that's my, I think of that as the purest example of uh, selling out where you're part of a small producer community that's uh, curating some sort of commons and you have an implicit agreement to sort of share in the sort of wealth from the commons and then you sort of um, defect. So it's like, it's a kind of tragedy of the commons. But like, I mean, okay. So even like big one name acts, like you said, Michael Moore, that's the one I'm gonna latch on to. You're saying he was part of a community of commons making his music and selling out was removing himself from that commons? Or not adequately sharing his rewards or not acknowledging. Like I think when he won best artist of the year or something, a lot of black um, music fans were complaining that Macklemore's uh, songs were kind of like stylistically inspired by this other new black musician who had just come up around the same time. And they were pissed that the black guy didn't get the uh, best new artist of the year. And I think that's the kind of thing that pisses people off that it's like, even if you're not in part of the same indie music scene playing in the same clubs and like hanging out and drinking beer, yeah. I mean, it's the internet now, like you can get inspiration in lots of like ways. You can like be listening to some music scene in like some unknown subculture. And then you realize that, hey, these people singing in Serbian or something, uh, nobody else ever s listens to them. And I can just like put English lyrics to that Serbian song and sell it and nobody will know, right? That So at, at some point, this kind of selling out turns into, I guess, the appropriation conversation. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk about maybe how, um, how would you sell out? What would it look like for Venkat to sell out? I think this is where buying in comes in. Like you can only sell out if you've made certain promises in the first place, either implicit social contract promises 
are like economic promises. And you haven't made any promises is what you're saying. I think like this is like I where this don't is think going. I have. I mean, is you getting written up in the New York Times some amount of selling out? I think fluence is- uh, Okay, the if there's a selling out, there's somebody I have sold out. So who have I sold out uh, in that case? Would it be the readers, other bloggers? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I guess like I, I mean like it would it would be selling out. I think if hmm, if you went to work for some publication, I feel like like a so like suddenly we're putting your blog on like as a columnist somewhere. That's a little bit. Of no, no, out. I, I don't think that would be called selling out. That would be considered just quitting or like um, you know taking the easy route for money or something like that. Selling out has like some element of betrayal of trust. Like somebody trusts you to do something and then you stop doing it. Um, in exchange for money. Or anything else, like uh, any other kind of like betrayal to an alternate sort of um, mode. So, okay, it, it's really, you have something you think is shared and then one person basically empties out the joint bank account basically. Like, uh, I mean, you know, since we talk about crypto a lot, like, um, multi-sig wallets, but not the kind where, you know, majority have to sign, but the kind where any of the signatures can like empty out all the cash. It's something like that, right? Like bank accounts are like that. As those don't really exist really, but I can well, see- Well, uh, joint bank that. accounts, you can do that. Joint bank accounts, you can do that. Yeah, okay, so let's not talk crypto, but a joint bank account, one person can empty it out, right? So. But like, I don't know, I guess I'm still thinking about the music stuff. One person getting a contract doesn't mean the other people in the community can't get contracts. It's just. Well, that's where you have to ask, all right, who has more ability to get a contract? Like in the, the black and white case is literally black and white. It's at least like several decades ago when it was much easier for white artists to get contracts, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I think there's a definite asymmetry there, right? It's like, all right, on the one hand, on the cultural scene, you're pretending that you're all sort of creative equals and like borrowing freely from each other, copying each other's musical styles but one of you has more ability to sell it in the marketplace and you do, and you don't give anything back to the other person. To me, that's a fairly clear definition of selling it out, selling out. And I think the, uh, which do you think is the more uh, clear case, selling out the trust of an audience or a consumer or selling out the trust of a fellow sort of creative partner or producer? I, I so I had been thinking about it in context of the audience. Um... That's interesting. I mainly think about it in context of the producers. Right. You mean producers meaning the cl other collaborators of the person? Yeah. I mean, there's, this is like such a trope, like in the music industry alone have several dozen of them. Like there's a band and then the lead singer goes off and does a solo album. That's the rest yeah. of the band kind of like gets pissed off, right? Well, yeah, they kind of just got the shaft a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but there it gets complex because um, maybe the rest of the band members genuinely aren't uh, like, this is where the he said, she said comes in, where the lead singer can say, I'm carrying the band, I'm the creative force, I'm writing the music and doing the leads. And you're just Ringo Starr, the drummer, and you write crappy songs, right? And so the other, so everybody may feel betrayed. Like um, the person who does the betraying may feel they were not appreciated enough the people who feel betrayed feel that they were not compensated enough. Yeah, yeah, lots of betrayal, betrayal of trust. So I, I think this trust thing is interesting. Should we talk about trust on our next episode? Did we talk about trust last time, last series? I feel like we talked about trust a lot. I'll have to Did go we? back and like what we talked about last series. Yeah, we should talk about trust, S and T. Yeah. So next week, let's talk about trust. But here I think, uh, Still staying with the selling out, I think one thing that strikes me is if you and I have an implicit social contract we, and we the whole point of implicit is since we haven't made it explicit, mm -hmm. we may actually have very different beliefs about it and never actually like uh, work it out, right? So right. the drummer might think that, hey, they're equal partners in the band, but the lead singer thinks that um, he's like 75% of the band, right? So they might have like very, like if you ask them, like literally if you ask them, what's your percentage contribution to the band yep. and you add them up, it's going to end up greater than 100%. Everybody will think they contribute more than others think they are, do. 
Uh, so is one of oh. us going to sell out Scorpio season? Is that oh, right? Absolutely. I feel like that's what we're dancing around <laughs> here. Um, like a implicit contract around Scorpio season brand, whatever. Um, I'm totally uh, selling it out to the big podcast network. Yeah, I don't know how would we how would we sell out. I guess yeah, selling out Scorpio season would. I guess we could launch. Is like launching a, a token a way of selling out? Um, well, one of us should take the shared assets and go off and do something solo with it, right? That's what it would mean. I see. Something like that, though. It's harder to do with something like this, where it's hard to see like what the sort of shared common wealth is. But for example, if we were uh, doing a fiction um, thing where, I don't know, we, uh, maybe we were telling jokes in a particular style and everybody made, sort of liked it and it was like a popular style and it was called mm -hmm. the Scorpio season style of jokes. But then I went off and did something that I call maybe Aries season. And then I make the same kinds of jokes, but kind of pretend it's a different thing. That would be a kind of sellout, right? Uh, yeah, I see. So, okay, I see. You're sort of like picking up the comments, taking it with you, calling it mine now. It's like like the little comic where the guy is like, look, I made a thing. And the guy's like, oh, you, I made a thing. Like, you know, like they pass the little ball and it's like, oh, this is mine now. I made it. Um, so it's a little bit of doing that with the comments of like a, a thing. Yeah. And it's, I should mention this article by David Chapman called, I think, Geeks, Mops, and Sociopaths, where he talks about how subcultures evolve and how at some point a particular kind of sociopath comes in, takes everything of value in that subculture and goes off and sells it and sort yes. of, you know, uh, hollows out the subculture. And I think that's, that's a common pattern. And yeah. I mean, like, well, like, so let's take this back to like the Snoop Dogg NFTs, right? Like the, I mean, the, the common good is like Snoop Dogg and his talent or like his um, appeal to the audience, right? And then taking that and creating an NFT to sell to people is a little bit of like, it kind of feels like milking something that's not authentic. I don't know Wait, how to tie that in exactly. You kind of have to like be, okay. So when you talk about say the Snoop Dogg musical scene, there's multiple things there. There's the sort of, songs he's created in collaboration with other writers, his own sort of talent. Uh, but what does he have in common with the audience that should that's being betrayed? Like, that's the part I think, like, there has to be something shared that's being betrayed unilaterally. And I, I guess, like, the, yeah, I guess, like, the NFTs he's launching, I think, I haven't seen them. So I'm totally talking off the cuff here. But I'm guessing that they're not particularly artistic, or like, feel like they're like, um, like, honest artwork that sounds weird like, there's a difference between honest art and like art that's produced for its like saleability okay got it so in that case i would say the commons between the musician and his audience is something like a shared consensus on this is what high value music is and it has these high ideals embodied in it and therefore we are not going to debase that music by like uh, uh doing certain things with it it's like you know, the music is a sacred object and we all agree it's sacred, but then I go off and like make it less sacred. Like I'm trying to think of a good example. Like suppose somebody, like rappers often have like music about like, you know, um, against the police basically. So maybe there's lots of songs with uh, like anti-police rhetoric and stuff like that. Now, if a rapper were to go off and then write like a song for pay for police departments saying, hey, now we should all love the police. Now that would be like a very clear betrayal of the shared value of, the police are, um, you know, assholes or whatever, right? So yeah. that's that's the kind of thing I think fans get most pissed off about. That hey, we thought we had the shared belief that the police were assholes, and then you went off and sold out. Same thing with like, um, uh, oh yeah, I think startups and things like that. So if you start a startup saying like, uh, we believe in design values or anti VC, and we are not going to take VC funding, and somebody goes off and takes VC funding, that's an example. Yeah, it is. That's right. And also, it kind of you're bring, it brings to mind the whole Google don't be evil, right? Because I don't know who they sold that out to, but they definitely removed don't be evil from their, I don't know, corporate charter, like list of values. I don't know what you call that, but that, that's ever, selling out, right? Uh, was it ever formally part of it? I don't know. 
apparently they had it painted on a wall and it got like painted over like oh okay yeah, yeah but like, painted on a wall i think might have been some employees doing it i don't think it was ever part of the official mission so it might have been loser employees but didn't it come from it. the ceos like it's definitely like it was no it wasn't the backstory yeah. of that is there was some meeting about some algorithm and one of the people in the meeting simply scrawled on the whiteboard don't be evil so this is not one of those ceo things so you but it was a core it. value of the company not officially i think it but became it was a core value of the company it is it was, it was a core value of the company right so it was a core value of certain employees who used to talk about it a certain way. I don't know that it was. It's is interesting though that like it's interesting that you're so adamant that this isn't part of the history. Like I feel like you're like a little bit attempting to rewrite some history here. No, no, it is. It like totally that. is. I'm just pointing out that I'm not sure it was ever part of a mission statement or something. Like it was never something that um, the CEO signed off on in a blog post or something. I think it came from like you know like organic culture. It's organic then, culture of the company though. Yeah. yeah. So and that's a part of the trust. And someone at some point like made it, made a conscious effort to drive it out of the of the of the culture. Yeah, and a lot of employees felt betrayed. So I would say don't be evil was a contract between certain employees and the management where yeah. they kind of assumed that hey, we all believe in don't be evil. Right. So yeah. someone sold someone out somewhere. Yeah, I think Maybe. the management sold a uh, idealistic employee group out. Yeah. I don't know that it was ever that important for consumers because most consumers never even knew about it. So, is that I mean, true, though, Minkat? Where's your evidence? I need to see at least like five citations for that. Hello, everybody in the world uses Google. How many people do you think follow like tech news to the point that they know that Google has a slogan "Don't be evil"? I think very few. You and I, yeah, people yeah, in the tech yeah, scene. Yeah. I, you know, talking to people outside of the tech scene. Te remains to be a hard, difficult thing to do. I mean, you don't have to strive that hard. Google is used around the world. And I know for a fact, my parents in India don't know, don't be evil. They don't follow tech closely enough, They follow, but they use Google, so. Yeah. so. That's one person, Venkat. I think we need at least 40 for like a rigorous study. I think I can extrapolate to a billion in India. <laughs> Comfortably, you're comfortable doing that, Comfortably. I see, okay. Well, don't, yeah, okay. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. yeah anyway. Yeah, so that's selling out. We didn't talk much about the other flip side of it, buying in. Buying well, what in. about you? Have you ever bought in unironically into something and then sold out? And then sold out later? I mean, I think I've bought into a lot of stuff. I don't know if I've sold out on anything quite yet. Um, Hacker Spaces, San Francisco. Uh, I think I did buy in. Hacker Spaces is definitely a thing I did earlier in my 20s. I don't do them anymore. I don't know if I sold out though. Maybe I have sold out a little bit. Mm. You just aged out of it, maybe. I think did, did you age out of it? Like, is it like a young person's game, like twenties? It might be. Yeah. And I have other things. I think like the thing is like hackerspace was good for space and exposure to like ideas and like certain ethos and whatnot. And I don't know. I have like a career now. <laughs> <laughs> I sold that out. That sounds a like bit. a sellout line. That sounds like a sellout life. <laughs> yeah, no. I think it is. I think I did sell out. I got a job. <laughs> I get paid to work on open source software now. And you abandoned all your unpaid hobby projects, right? Like your moon clock is still sitting around. Your fiction is kind of like languishing. All I mean, that. the moon clock, to be fair, hangs on my wall and I look at it every day, but no one else can look at it every day, so. But weren't a lot of people expecting you to like package and sell them? There was a lot of interest. It? So you sold out that interest? Uh, no, I just said I'm going to do it after I finished my big project and my current job, and it's taken a lot longer than I thought it would, to be fair. All right. But I did, yeah, I've kind of, I don't know. All right, so that's selling out and buying in. Huh. Okay. Cool. Are we done with our thoughts on selling out? I think so. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So that's it for this week then. So we'll talk about trust next week, right? Trust next week. All right. Look forward to it. All right. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.